is pretty simple today because I believe it should be so. And we will discuss why and how for every technology we are going to talk about. So, why we want to make application faster and why we want to make the code better. It's useful from two perspectives. First perspective, it's business perspective because fast code, it's better code, and or I'm sorry, fast up, it's better up, it uh, gives more money from customers, it's better and gives best user experience. And we also want to have code better in terms of fixed budgets uh, because, you know, it's pretty hard to sell, for example, unit test without any argumentations. Well, why do we need them? So, we need to balance between fast development, uh, good applications, and good code. Uh, today I'm going to talk about Angular internals, and I want to start from data binding. And data binding in Angular. Uh, first of all, I want to ask you, how many people here, please raise your hands, are working with Angular 2? Okay, and please, uh, guys, please keep your hands up, and please raise your hands who works with Angular 4. Okay, I expect a little bit more, but okay, we can proceed. So I explain a little bit in more detailed way. Uh, Data binding in general is a good thing, but it can cause a big problems uh, if you use it without understanding how does it work. Uh, in general, uh, roots of data binding comes from really old frameworks, and it was required even in really old frameworks. And lack of it caused many useless, weird solutions. First, really useful and working version of data binding, which uh, we really liked, were in first Angular and Knockout.js. Uh, so, where, where does it come from? Uh, I will explain how does the change detection strategies work and why do we need them. Uh, just imagine a DOM tree. We have like root element and many leaves there. If we have update in any leaf there, it will update the entire branch of DOM elements. That's why old frameworks were slow. Uh, it's the main reason why uh, change detections came from. Uh, let me explain. Uh, we have two ways of data binding. First way, uh, first use case, it's a link uh, between template and view model. For example, we have some data in uh, view model which we want to represent in our template, just simple value. And if user change something or we uh, are getting some event, we want to update it. Uh, so I repeat, we updating some value from view model, you can tell it controller if you want. And also it might be a link between two view models. For example, you have a template, you have an input there, and you have another view model, and you want to update a value between this input and value in another model. Uh, it it's all can be explained as a cycle. Uh, just see. Uh, we are starting here, so browser rendered some page with our web application and user changed something. For example, he typed something in input. Afterwards, view triggers event with changes, like, okay, user changed something and our view model, uh, which is super subscribed to it, uh, gets values which user typed, uh, calculates something, for example, some dependent values, and afterwards view model modifies view in some way. And all frameworks work in this way. And the most expensive operation in 
in terms of performance is updating of our DOM tree. In the beginning, I told you that every update of leaf triggers update of entire branch of DOM elements. And it's very expensive operation, especially if you have, for example, some big read. If you update one cell, you have to update half a table, and it's really expensive. So modern framework, fr frameworks works in another way. And uh, they have some mechanism to prevent updating of DOM tree when there is no changes. For example, user typed something, but it didn't affect anything in our template, in our view. So we shouldn't update anything. Old frameworks uh, hasn't checked uh, did user change anything or not. So action happened. We calculated values. Even they stay the same. We update the view. Now contemporary frameworks are smarter. They check values. And only if value was updated, we update view. So if nothing happened, we won't spend resources on rendering the same view, the same templates. So there are two popular options how we can do it. And uh, two conceptually different ways. First is Virtodom. It's used in React and it's pretty effective. And abstract syntax tree. It's something which React uses. Abstract syntax tree is. Nice I'm sorry, yes, and uh, just a mistake. Uh, so, Virtual.dom creates uh, some uh, additional copy of your DOM, operates with it in operation memory, and updates it if only if it has changed. Abstract syntax tree doesn't create a copy of your DOM, but it creates a tree out of your DOM, like it can be represented like something similar to JSON with structure, uh, where you can see all information about this node, uh, information about even listeners, value which is located there, so nothing special. And how does it work? Uh, Angular, uh, let's start from here, variable changes. Uh, Angular compares new and old values uh, in this syntax tree. Uh, I mean, it checks old value in syntax tree and new value in wherever. And if there were any changes, it updates view. Otherwise, it keeps it as it is. And in the end, it saves copy of all values to a new syntax tree. Uh, and in particular, it just updates old syntax tree to be more performance. So if you are using it in a good way, it works good. So let's uh, check it on more practical example. For example, we have application. It's a root node. We have some header. We have sidebar widgets. And we have component with changes. Uh, and for example, one component changed variable. So we have some special thing which is called zone. What what's happened? Uh, what happens on there is uh, Angular uh, <coughs> core inside the Angular core? We have one thing. It's called zone JS, and it is responsible for uh, handling changes listening to changes in Angular 2 and Angular 4, and I'm pretty sure in Angular 5 as well. <coughs> uh, so this zone checks the changes in your code. Uh, and if something has changed, it notifies the whole application. Afterwards, uh, from the root node, happens update of all values changed in the application. So all these uh, DOM elements are going to be updated. So for out the box, Angular works in this way. So we changed something and we updated it. Uh, and one of the question is always important and interesting. For example, if I want to update just one value from some particular component, 
which is located on the lower level. For example, we want to update something in header from widgets. It's one of the biggest place with pitfalls because you can uh, get in trouble there. And I prepared some examples uh, how to avoid it. So let me show some code. Oh, no. It's super important, I believe. Oh, this way. <laughs> So it is an empty, almost empty, Angular application. I generated it with Angular Cli, and uh, we will run it. Uh, sorry. And I will show you the code. So. We have some components just made for example, so I didn't care about anything there. And they just simple to just highlight how does it work. We will use this application to uh, see the different examples. And let's start. So we have our application here. And I will show you how the DOM tree works. First of all, it's very important to keep uh, in mind the difference between primitives and other types, such as objects and arrays, because they behave differently. So let me show you how does the change detection works for primitives with the default change detection strategy. So we have some variable, variables, and it is propagated from the top to the bottom level. Sorry, for colors, I just made it to highlight it to <coughs> explain how does it work. It's not some, it doesn't have some cool design, sorry for it. <laughs> so uh, we will change variable, for example, here. And you can see how it has propagated to the higher component, but has not propagated to the top. That's the first <coughs> trouble you can meet. Uh, also, you can see how propagation works if you change variables, primitive variables, in higher order components. You can update it, and here you are. All nodes were updated with this component, uh, with these values. So let me show what we have inside. We have, sorry, three examples, and here are just two folders with two components. First was primitive element, and you can see here just simple markup, simple template. And <coughs> uh, how I did it, I just rendered it recursively by three levels. So just the same component renders three components inside itself. Another forward unit test, and uh, you can see the data. This commented uh, code will be required for us later to show how detection strategies work. So what we have? We can, we can propagate value from the top to the lowest level, and we can propagate primitive uh, to highest level by default. That's the first item I wanted to highlight. Also, we can play with objects. Let me check we have default Propagation strategy, oh, yes, I'm happy, I checked it. And I'll explain you how we can handle objects or arrays. For example, <coughs> uh, you can see text, but it isn't primitive. It's a key of objects. So uh, here is our component. And you can see data. So we are displaying user input. So in previous example, we had, sorry, we had primitive, so it was just a text. And in the new example, we have object. And we display information from 
key of this object. So what's going to happen if we update values? You can see that oppositely to primitives, it updates the entire tree. And it updates it not because uh, it handles objects in different way, not. Just because all those values are linked to the reference to this object. And that's why when we update value, it updates everywhere because it is propagated everywhere here by reference. It's the same objects. Uh, oppositely to case with primitive, it doesn't copy values. It propagates link to it. Uh, if we change it on the highest level, you can see the same way, the same situation. So how we can deal with it? Uh, first of all, I want to say that it's uh, easy to use and it's very popular in Angular applications, but it's not performant because it's caused lots of uh, zone actions and it's hard to control it. So what can we do and how we can handle it? We can use change detection strategy on push. Uh, okay, I have several slides about it. I'll come back to them. And what can we do? So I enabled change detection strategy on push and for uh, object component. And I will try to update value now. What can we see? It's propagated only to the top level. It hasn't propagated to another objects uh, because it listens only to change of the variable. And that's what I'm talking about. If we want to update the entire tree, we need to do something like this. What I'm doing here, I'm rewriting the data. I'm updating reference to the data. What does it mean? If we change value in user input, just change values there. It keeps reference to data the same. Object stays the same. You just change property of this object. And that's not an option. If you rewrite the entire object, it will trigger change detection because on push listens only to the references in objects, not to the key changes there. So we'll save it and yes, it's compiled and I will change it again. It doesn't work because we need also to use additional lifecycle hook. Uh, in Angular 4 and Angular 2, uh, there is some additional uh, lifecycle cycle hooks you can use uh, to control change detections. So what does it mean? It's called ng do check and we can just mark for check values here. You don't need it. Just from previous example, and now you can see that all application triggered the change, and it saved it. It applied it, and it propagated the entire app. So, coming back to the presentation, uh, that's why, because of those complicated situations, which are not so logical sometimes. Uh, solutions when we are changing variables in upper level components through the lower level components uh, are looking like this. So not so good. And in some cases, it's better to use some service which implements publisher subscriber or something like this. So I already explained it. So. The main reason that it's not so good to use default change detection strategy in some cases, and it's not so good to rely uh, that it will propagate it automatically. We should to control it, at least check it. So there is a very good speech which goes much deeper than I went here today about change detection strategies. You can watch it. Uh, it was presented one year ago on NG Europe, as far as I can remember, it's called this conference, and it might be very useful for you. So, let's go. 
what can help us uh, to control our data and to avoid pitfalls on the uh, working process with those change detection strategies. It's time to talk about functional programming and immutable data types. It's on top of hype now, but it's really useful here. And I'll explain why. So uh, please raise your hands who use, it, use uh, functional programming in your code. Oh, much better, much better than, much more than people who use Angular and it's more ways, it's good. Uh, so, uh, I wanted uh, to say that my explanation is simplified. I'm not gonna cover entire functional program in this speech, so please forgive me if I'll uh, leave something outside it. Uh, so, what is a functional programming? If we'll simplify the definition, it's more about two points. First point is usage of pure functions. Please ra raise your hands who use, uh, who use <coughs> who understand what pure, <coughs> I'm sorry, pure functions are. That's great. Pure functions are functions uh, which doesn't interact with data outside them. They have some inputs, they have some outputs, and they won't we mutate everything outside them, and they don't uh, mutate arguments which came inside. Also, <coughs> it's usage of immutable data structure. It means that if we want to update some variable, we'll, uh, some object, we'll create a new one. If we want to update some array, we'll create a new one instead of previous one to update the reference to this object or array. Uh, so, we can use this <coughs> paradigm with on push detection strategy. Uh, in code, you've seen uh, how we can <coughs> update the entire object. I redefined it, I updated a key, created a new object with this key, and created a new object instead of modifying old one. So, that's what we need. Uh, so we can use it with on push. It's faster for big data structures, and it's really useful with big grids. And it, please keep in mind, it won't fix code instead of you. So it can help you, but it's not kind of silver bullet which solves all your problems. It solves problems of Angular. It solves problem of useless uh, change detection listeners. So on push simplifies the app, reduce the performance overhead, but makes things a little bit more complicated. And you probably won't need it. So it's <coughs> something you need to big amount of data, to big structures where you have many DOM elements, many listeners, and many points when places where data represents. So on push schema, uh, Sorry, I put it by mistake. So, data structures. It's easy. Mutable and immutable. Mutable data structures are all complicated data structures in JavaScript. If you can update some objects, it's mutable. If you can update, push some value into array, it's mutable. And it's what we need to avoid when we are using on push scheme. So, we are interested in immutable values. Uh, so, data mutations. What's data mutations and why we need to care about it? Um, to prevent data mutations, uh, to create a new objects instead of old ones, we can follow different ways. First way is pretty simple. It doesn't require any libraries. We can do it ourselves. We can use methods of arrays to create new arrays instead of modifying old ones. We can uh, use object assign or it's analogs to create a new objects. So for some singular cases, it works. And in some cases, it doesn't matter in which way we will create immutable values. Also, we can use libraries for it, uh, like immutable maps, set. There are plenty of libraries you can use for it. 
And the last option, you can use monads. It's something what I really like and what I will tell you today about. So, classic one. As I mentioned, it's object assign and it's <coughs> a copying of arrays. There are <coughs> actually many ways to do it without any libraries. I just mentioned the simplest ones. Also, what are immutable data structure? I promised to explain you. So, <coughs> it's the simple example, just uh, taken from immutable. You can create immutable map. Map is something similar to object, the classical object in JavaScript. So we created some map. You can see that we passed a regular obje object inside, but we got a map outside. And you can see that we uh, set the value. But moment, it creates a new object, so it doesn't mutate dog one. It returns on a new, new object, which is similar to previous one, but has one changed value. So you can see that if you get edge of different objects, we can see that we have two different objects, actually. So, uh, okay, if it's clear with immutable data structures, what are monads? And monads are containers. Um, monads were created uh, many years ago. It's not a new paradigm, but it's not so popular in JavaScript. It's pretty popular in other functional languages. So, monads are containers. Just imagine that monad is a container outside of any type, outside of any data type. And you can call the same, me same methods on the different types. What I'm talking about? Just take <coughs> an example with classical array, just array of three numbers, and we'll call filter method on it. So, it will create a new value. It will return a new value, it won't mutate it. And as a result, we'll get primitive. We'll get a number. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll get array with primitive, it's number. So we'll modify, we'll create a new array out of it. Just imagine you can use filter map uh, to objects, not only to arrays. You can use it to, you know, for example, to primitive as well. And sometimes it's extremely useful. So what are we going to reach with uh, monads? Just imagine that we have whatever. We don't know what it actually is. And we can call map on it and call any method on it. And I will show the example of special library. It's called monad.js. Has anyone used it? Uh, it's very un unpopular, but one of the most popular libraries for monads on JS. So. Uh, we can take a number. Um, maybe it's a uh, library itself, it's monad.js. We put some value into container. So now, entire these things creates a container with a number. And we can call a map on it, like on array. And as a result, we can create a new value, value instead of modifying old one. And we can call any method on it. And it doesn't matter for us what kind of data type is inside here. Why is it better than we'll just write something like something equals one to three plus one? I'll explain to you. For example, we can use additional methods in chain. There are plenty of them in <coughs> monad.js itself and in other libraries. And so you can call, for example, a standard method is sum. So <coughs> if we'll pass now or undefined here, we can call a sum and it will return some default value. We can specify some default value, uh, value here. <coughs> uh, so it really helps. It's a kind of prevention of uh, such problems like uh, um, <coughs> analogs of now pointer exception in different other languages. So we can see 
a more practical example here. And so here is person, some methods which accepts four names, surname and address. And as a result, it returns us a string. And we can get some data, gather it inside some variables. And we don't know what is inside, so it might be variables. And we can generate a string, so you can see how does it work. So it's safe, it won't break with some unexpected values. And sometimes such um, way of writing code is really simpler and more useful. Uh, for example, there are some default methods you can use. You can use bind, flat map, chain map, join, take left. You can see just interface of them. And <coughs> what what might surprise you that the most why I say it Monad is one of the most popular libraries because I believe the most popular library for Monads is RxJS. RxJS, which we are using in Angular 2, Angular 4, is actually Monad. Angular 2, I mean, Rx returns us some values. We can, of course, uh, do something simple like just subscribe or make uh, a promise out of it, or we can use it as Monad. So uh, we have plenty of options, and there are more than 100 methods in RxJS, actually, which are really useful. So there are many ways how we can handle data from server in a chain in functional way, just using standard RxJS, which are provided by Angular itself. So we can go deeper. And uh, I also mentioned about mark for, uh, or check for check, which allows us to run the don't.js manually. But also, I didn't mention two things. It is detach and reattach. For example, we know for sure that now we are going to make some complicated cal calculations which are going to cause some series of changes and we want to avoid them. We want to avoid tracking of those changes. It might be very useful. Uh, for example, just imagine some simple scroll which changes something. And we don't want to update entire view just for every step of scroll. It will make application extremely <coughs> slow. And the same, for example, if we have a big data grid and we need to scroll it, we can detach listeners for cells which are uh, located outside the visible viewports. For example, just imagine grid 1000 divided by, I don't know, 20 columns, for example, and every cell contains some input. It's real situation, such <coughs> a situation really exists. And to keep performance on some acceptable level, you can keep values in cells outside without listeners during the implementation. And in its case, uh, we were the detach helped us a lot. When cells comes into back, you can use reattach. And it will continue to listen for changes. So was that effective? Yes, it was effective for some cases. But if we we'll take in mind we will use it on some small applications. For example, you will use it on some small crude. It won't help you because it's easy to guess. I believe that all those immutable data structures are slower as data structure itself because they are not really exist in JavaScript. They are all emulated. And all those immutable data, structure, data structures are we using, they are just level of abstraction over the real data types. So for small applications, it doesn't affect it. For big applications with a complicated DOM structure, yes, it is. So, yes, so here is an example where it's really useful. Uh, and what's another proof of uh, cases where we can walk is it's just more for extra joke. Yeah, we probably heard about 1,000 uh, listeners in Angular 1, like a limit after all, uh, which breaks listeners. So I checked it in Angular 2, and all uh, those rows, all next row is uh, children of previous one. 
So it's like Rainier tree, where data propagates from lowest uh, cell to upper cell. So 200 layers. And if you change this one, like the lowest way level, you can see it, it changed values, but not everything. So if you want brick angular, here is the recipe. Also, I want to talk about reactive forms. Uh, it's uh, another topic, so it's not about immutable data structures anymore. And what are immu uh, reactive forms? Please raise your hands who you are using any reactive forms in your applications. OK. And there are two ways how we can organize forms in Angular. First way, just use ng model, use some directives on inputs and manage validation, gather data out of inputs, and use them. Uh, and there is another way for uh, forms. <coughs> when I spoke about this topic several months ago, I told that it's useful only for big tables, for big forms, I'm sorry. But now I'd like to say that it's useful everywhere in any form. Uh, so, what are reactive forms? Uh, I also show some code now. So, it is the same application, but another example. So, we'll make a step back. And here is an example. Just imagine a form with three inputs. Uh, all those inputs have to be validated after the first change. And we should handle button, so we should disallow user to submit the form before he'll put the correct values everywhere. And also we need to handle next parameters which are available in reactive forms. So form is valid, form is touched, form status, and form is pristine. So let's update it. You can see that form is pristine and it's not touched, and form status is invalid. Um, for beginning, I'll write something. I don't know. Write a bit, John. I'll write incorrect email, and you can see it says I did something wrong, so I fix it. and some pad. And you can see that uh, pad input becomes yellow. It's something what is very important. It's a sync validator. It's a very useful case. And I'll explain how does it work. So step by step. How does it work? We have form example. Mm. Let's start from the simplest one and come back to the uh, async, async validators back later. Uh, so this form, I'll fill it, something, whatever, something. And our animal is illegal, so we have validator for it. It's a custom validator. So. Uh, I will show you the markup. And it's easy. Yes? Angor. Uh, so, you can see the form. Uh, form is pretty simple. So, here is label. It's not interactive. There is input, it's interactive, and it doesn't uh, have any uh, attributes relating, related to validation. So just form name and just some alert to display the error. Uh, so it's pretty simple. We have also a component which declares the form. So 
you can see our demonstration form and you can see that we have validators. We have default object validators. Uh, so we just included it here and we can use it afterwards. So one of the default validators is an required validator. Also we have default validator to validate patterns. So for name, it doesn't matter for us what user writes. It's important that he writes some acceptable sim symbols. Here it's here only uh, what in symbols and also we can use minimal length. So we just specified three validators, specified the form, the form declaration, we specified form control name, so it is a key of the object, so it is username. You can see it's form control name, and that's it. It works out of the box. So if I write two symbols, it's incorrect. If I leave it empty, it's incorrect. If I write some, I don't know, wrong symbols, for example, Russian ones, they are also incorrect. So you can, you need to type only English ones. So, okay, it's clear with name. It's easy enough. Also, we have the fault validator for email. It doesn't follow that big regular uh, expression uh, related to ISO standard, which is extremely big. It just checks uh, uh, that it's actually some email in the easiest way, so be careful with it, and that's it. And the most interesting part that it is about custom validators because forms are easy before it comes to custom validation. So we can declare, declare any validator in some simple way. You can see pet validator and how does it work here? It's easy, it's really easy. So uh, you can see that we have some disallowed animals, I can type Octopus, crocodile, or seal. And just a second. I'm trying to understand what went wrong. Uh, no, 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 it's. Oh yes, no, it was a sync and it is sync. I made a mistake somewhere, just a second. So we are using it here and by the way, it's very important. I wanted to show you that under the hood, this validator is just code with every change of our input. So I added a console work here. So we really validated and you can see that, oh, I see, I'm sorry, I haven't saved, I believe I haven't saved just it and let's try it again. So I will type something. And you can see that it's called the sync validator again. Oh, yes. I'm sorry, it's too obvious. Validate pet. <coughs> <coughs> so now, yes, I typed whatever, it works. I typed seal, it doesn't work, I change it, it works. And you can see in the console that it validates every symbol I'm writing, so in pretty simple way. So there is no any rocket science with those validators and they are pretty easy organized. So okay, if we validate something without asynchronous sections, it's easy. But just imagine the case, for example, you have a form and you have an email there for a user and you want to check the email on server. Not only that this email follows the rules, but you want to check does this email exist on your server and is user allowed to use this email or he should use another one. Of course, you can make a request to the server, wait for error, handle the error and <coughs> put some uh, Earlier there, but it's not the best way, and even more, it's not the easiest way. The easiest way is to use 
validate pad async, which uh, implements async validation. So how does it work? Uh, I'll hide this one. And async validator is also simple. I remove user swines, so we have 22 lines of async validation. So how does it work? It works easy. So we have async validator, which accepts form control, which has disallowed any mouse. Um, and it validates them. So if our element exists and disallowed any mouse, it won't work. And we also uh, return promise. So the difference between async validator and rigor promise, uh, rigor validator, that async returns promise, and Angular can handle it itself. Uh, so we have also uh, check any mouse function, which was described here, <coughs> and I I've just emulated a request to the server, just adding timeout to make it easier. So it waits one second and a half, and afterwards it, ret it returns something. So let's try how does it work. So I typed something, it waited. Uh, you can see that it was like might be HTTP request, so it waited for uh, one second and a half, checked uh, the value, so that it isn't panda, horse, and elephant, and then it returned us that it is all right. So if I'll type horse, for example, I'll get an error. And it becomes really useful on complicated forms, which are highly related on the server-side data. Strongly recommend it. Yes. Uh, you can prohibit it from being uh, submitted before it will happen. Uh, you can see, <coughs> uh, I'll explain now. Uh, we will inspect this element. Uh, developers of Angular predicted your question and this problem. And you can see that while uh, here is statuses, and they are available not only as statuses in uh, DOM tree. They are also pro uh, available as the statuses of form elements inside your code. So it's very easy to reach them. And when you are typing something, it becomes ng pending. I, I can change the interval to let everyone see it. OK, let it be 10 seconds. Uh, again, so this input, we'll make sure that it is selected now, yes. And I will type something. and. Now it is independent. So we can gather data that all inputs were touched, all inputs has status that they are ng valid, and afterwards we can unlock the button. So it works here exactly, exactly in this way. So now I will type something, it's everything OK, and save is active. So that's how. It works here. Also, you can see the float status as a form. And what I want to uh, highlight here, you have two opposite uh, attributes. Form is touched, and form is priced in. So <coughs> uh, just observe those values. I focused on the input, and I'm starting typing something. You can see that form isn't touched yet hasn't touched yet, but uh, it isn't pristine anymore. So pristine triggers when we started typing, but didn't trigger the change event. As touched is triggered only when we ch uh, unfocused the input, saved the value, and afterwards it triggered. So let's come back to our presentation. Uh, The most, I guess, logical questions after these forms uh, are questions how we can update values in forms without uh, <coughs> events from DOM tree. 
For example, we got some data from the server without user interaction or it was some kind of web socket and we want to update value in the form. This can be easily done just directly with code patch value and set value. Also, you have special methods to reset form, so it also won't be a problem. And it also why it's really useful because when you use a bunch of NG models, it might be really complicated to use it. So, I explained how does the touched work, how does the valid work, validators, custom validators, and its example. So, yes, and I also shown you this one. Uh, submitting a form also happening in a good way, I will explain. Uh, not good, I mean simple and uh, easy way, very fast to do it. Uh, for example, if I will fill the form, I'm sorry, some email, doesn't matter what, some pet which is legal, and I want to submit data. I, oh, okay, we have to wait 10 seconds, I'm sorry. I didn't return it back. Uh, I use I use my own. Uh, <coughs> no, it's not own. Yes, it disables because you can see. Just I will show you. Yes, yes, yes. You can see that button trigger uh, handles only one parameter of form, so valid form has its own valid parameter. So I uh, don't need to check every input manually. Uh, Generally, the standing form and then the form. Yes. Okay. And it's, it's extremely useful. Uh, so, yes, coming back to the code, and I just edit console work on submit. So, I just gather value of the entire form in this way, just one parameter. And yes, it's finally validated. I can click save, and we got an object. This is all data from the form. It's also very useful. So, let's go next. Uh, form statuses, uh, the forms ha have different statuses like invalid. <coughs> and I'm sorry, I said incorrectly. It has state, form itself has state uh, pending. Not uh, uh, invalid, but pending for form. And um, it has state valid. But you can listen just to valid state and all other statuses are invalid for you. And also, it's very interesting thing which I uh, can't cover in this presentation because it's also a big topic which can be discussed on separate talk. It's form arrays. Um, this, this component of Angular forms, reactive forms, supports dynamic forms. For example, uh, just imagine user handles some list and you can add a new lines there with new inputs and you don't know amount of them. You don't know how much fields are going to be there and you generally can generate forms dynamically and you can handle them exactly in this way. So it also appears useful. For example, you have a table with users who are going to attend some event, for example, it talk. And you can click, for example, plus button to add more lines with inputs where you can fill the data. And you can do it automatically with reactive forms and form arrays, which is also very useful. So, yes. And the last topic to interact yourself, it's Angular animations. When we are talking about animations and web, it also associates in my mind with something with this, like, like this. <coughs> and let's talk about this. As I mentioned before, when you change something in Node tree, it updates the entire uh, branch in, in the DOM tree. So if you change one leaf, it updates the entire branch. So uh, that's the main difference between CSS driven animation and JavaScript driven animation. Because, for example, libraries such as jQuery, they just uh, change something in very frequent uh, manner. So, for example, if you want to move 
some object, some diff from one place to another place, make it bigger. It will update it like every 10 to 20 milliseconds. And of course, it's a big effort for hardware. Uh, processor does it, and it's not all, always so fast, especially when you are moving big images. It's extremely slow. The <coughs> better option is to use CSS driven animations because they are powered by your graphic uh, cards and they are much more performant. They have better optimizations in browsers, in all contemporary browsers like um, in Chrome, in Safari, and in Firefox. And it works good there. But unfortunately, API of CSS animations is limited and it's hard to use them uh, from JavaScript. So new API appeared several years ago and uh, it's already supported in the most <coughs> popular browsers. Unfortunately, it doesn't work in Edge. I expected it to be working in 15, but nobody cares about. And I expected it to be working in Safari 11. I waited for presentation one week ago, but Safari came out, but support of web animation API hasn't. So, what is Web Animation API? Web Animation API is something which allows us to be faster, to have our animations faster, and to have better performance of animations. It allows us to use JavaScript animations and make it with use of graphic card, not processor, and make them extremely faster. So, it triggers CSS animations under the hood, but you declare what you want in JavaScript, it adds some CSS uh, information under the hood, which is not translatable for you. And uh, I mean, you as user won't see them. They are not applied like in DOM2E anywhere. It doesn't apply you as a style. So it triggers exactly under the hood of the browser. And uh, it works out of the box in Angular 2. And it doesn't work out of the box in Angular 4. And it's the most breaking change between Angular 2 and Angular 4, which should change the imports from core to Angular animations. So in our case, by the way, migration from Angular 2 to Angular 4 was exactly in changing those declarations, and it worked afterwards. What about the browser? It worked. As far as I can remember, it was OK. But it was half a year ago. Probably I forgot. <coughs> and OK, so I will show you some examples to explain why it's much easier to use Web Animations API. And I don't know. Uh, so we have another example. I can't promise you it would be <coughs> fast here because I'm also recording video from the screen now, but I'll try to animate it, and it's it's really fluent. Um, and you can see that it is just H1, and there is no any. You can see that it has styles; they are changing, but there is no any instructions for animation, and there is no. Uh, transitions for it. I will explain you how. So we have animation examples, of course, the user stuff. And you can see our examples. So it's a pretty simple component. We have like state uh, and we have a decoration. So Angular 4 and 2 the allows us to declare animations uh, with some level of abstraction, which is very easy. So we can declare a state, we can declare several states, and we can declare a transition between them. So we have transition green, which is the default one, as you can see. We have transition blue, which just changed the car and changed the letter spacing. And we have transition between them, which we are animating with different timeouts. 
Uh, you can also see the temp weight, which is simple, but the only difference, it follows the declaration. So we need to declare animation and default state of it. So now it can be easily done. And <coughs> why do we need an, it in Angular? Because it's framework not for games and animations mostly, but it's very cool for some uh, pages when you navigate between them, when something disappears, some pop-ups appear, and it makes it look better. And uh, comparing with classical animations made with JavaScript, they work fluently on Mac because personally I was surprised that when I bought a powerful laptop and realized that I can't uh, see fluent animations in <coughs> 2015 like on powerful machine because it has retina resolution and that's why browser can't ren render it fast. So this technology works fast on high res resolutions, on <coughs> pretty simple hardware, and was the most important on mobile phones because JavaScript animations on mobile phones, it's something, it's shame. And let's come back to our presentation. So, why it happens? Because Angular is going to encapsulate components in uh, simple models, which can be supported uh, independently out of the library. So, uh, that's it. Uh, I'd like to answer your questions if you have some. And I'm staying here, so if you have, want to talk personally, feel free. And yes, you can you'll be able to find the presentation on my blog, and feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Okay, <coughs> first of all, I will repeat questions because we are recording the streaming our event and we don't have microphones. So, question was that have I used React and can I compare them? Uh, personally, I think that React and Angular are absolutely different technologies made for different purposes. For, for some dynamic data, for some complicated um, structures where you should update DOM very frequently, I believe. React might be the be <coughs> best solution. For some um, complicated in terms of business logic, in terms of amount of pages, but this pretty simple logic of them, some CRUDs, some grids, I believe Angular is a good option. So I can't compare them directly. I just believe they were made for different purposes. <coughs> and the question, second question you wanted to ask, second one. Yes, we, we are using Angular CLI in production since uh, I believe it's release. Uh, we started using it with Angular 2 when it was uh, on system JS. And it was a big problem when um, Angular actually migrated to Webpack and uh, we weren't able to update. Uh, yeah. Now we are using it on Angular 4 and <coughs> it's something which I strongly recommend and I'm, I really like it because it makes applications more strict. Uh, it makes it's more predictable, and I really like that any application built with Angular Cli is familiar for me when I come into projects. It's something which looks like other projects on Angular. It's some kind of totalitarianism in development, but personally, I really like it. And also, it helps a lot. You know, code generation. I can't imagine my life without it now. No, they don't. I uh, did nothing because I haven't had such uh, <coughs> case when I needed it. Okay, really. Y 
you can put just Angular COI inside your project. You can put the fork of Angular COI inside your project the only way, I guess, you can take it. <laughs> Not only way, but the easiest way. But personally, I haven't met the situation where I really need it. I, I know such situations in React, and we used uh, Eject in uh, Create React App, but I haven't met the situation where I'm, I needed when I had to use it in Angular. Uh, first of all, different environments are provided out of the box in Angular CLI, and uh, it creates folder with environments. You can create uh, plenty of them. It's not limited, and we are using exactly uh, uh, default environments for it. You can just specify a flag in uh, commands, which when you run uh, in <coughs> build on serve, and it will work with this environment, and you can easily put the decoration inside your package JSON and just define like npm run production and npm run development and it works perfectly out of the box so I really like it and it can be easily uh, configured uh, without any efforts um, yes Uh, there are, uh, are some uh, shims for it. You can uh, <coughs> you can actually transpile it because it loses any sense of using it. But it has some shims for uh, Safari and for Internet Explorer. Uh, okay. Yes. At least it was. <laughs> oh no, no it doesn't. Uh, I've seen there are some libraries you can use as shims. Probably we used some library, probably I forgot. Some more questions, we have some stuff here. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the purposes we used it was for an example of uh, scroll and avoid of triggering, mm -hmm. for example, re-render on every pixel of scroll. Uh, what is the, why is, uh, for example, e dash and e dash later better than simple debounce? Uh, I'm not talking about the bouncing, I understand your point of view. I'm talking about the situation when you moved some cells outside um, the visible viewport. For example, you have some a big div which uh, cuts everything with, which is located outside it. For example, overflow uh, scroll. And uh, it's not a good idea to refresh everything in this table, even if it is located like in not visible zone. For example, you can uh, see only 5% of the table at the same time. In, in, in some particular moment. And so you don't need to update every 95% uh, of the grid when something changes. You can update uh, them later. So it helps a lot with big grids because grids are a big field for investigations. <laughs> yes? Uh, personally, I used reactive forms in the last project everywhere. And once I met a situation when I had two inputs, and I thought probably it doesn't uh, make sense to use React forms here. But afterwards, with experience of Re React forms, I realized that it was a bad idea to use just ng models there. And afterwards, I migrated back. Yes, you know, uh, in the first instance, it looks like 
Come on, it's easier to implement it without reactive forms, but when it comes to validation, especially for some specific validation, for some additional markup, because of course you can use this, by the way, you can use the same validators just as additional parameter in uh, declaration of your DOM element in the template and with ng model. And it will work. And it will keep data binding. For example, you can use uh, ng model some variable and validator, but it makes code more complicated. I compared even on small forms, and the reactive forms looks more elegant and uh, simple, and they are much easier to support. For them. It's easier to update something in code, and personally, if I can move something outside the template to the code, I, I prefer to do it because I don't like fat templates, but it's already uh, something, some Halibar topic. And there was some question. Uh, I can. Uh, okay. First of all, I want to highlight that first Angular and second Angular are different frameworks, and uh, I'd not recommend to learn uh, Angular first version of Angular in 2017 at all. Uh, of course, there are some legacy projects, but uh, its amount reduces, yes, and uh, of course, it has no uh, future, so it's legacy technology, and it's pretty complicated, you know. Um, I'd like to recommend to start with second or fourth version. They are pretty similar, almost the same, so of course, fourth. Yeah, yes, yes, yes. From the beginning of this uh, previous year, uh, Angular started updating their uh, framework to major version uh, half a year. So probably in the November we will see uh, Angular 5. And uh, every half a year they introduce some breaking changes. So between Angular 2 and Angular 4 they had some changes related to animations a bit of rotor and oh the yes, just small improvements which are not compatible with old one. So but like yes, 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 it can be migrated very fast. So <coughs> uh, if you worked with Angular 2, you even probably won't notice how we switch to Angular 4. So you can start with Angular 4, and it will be even easier than starting from the first one, because first one has many weird uh, functions. I'd like to say. Yes, 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 and you can build it up with Angular CLI. It helps you to avoid communications with Webpack, which are not always. Yes, always yes, yes. It works out of the box, and it allows you to generate code, because it's predictable and uh, it's always the same. You can generate uh, models, you can generate uh, components, you can generate services. Yes, yes, yes. And Unfortunately, yes, yes. And but uh, one plus to Angularly, it uh, <coughs> records all the references to new components to models automatically. For example, you created a component, it even added it into all models but yes, yes, yes. So it's super cool from my point of view, and you can start working with uh, Angular 4 without any overhead. Uh, now you can do the same with React, I believe, but, I, but when I met React in the first instance, I spent about one day just trying to uh, communicate its router made by one vendor with uh, React made with another vendor. Afterwards, I realized what Redux is. I tried to mix it up, and I spent a real day on it. So I spent just day on trying to mix it up with Webpack, and it was kind of boring. And That's yes. It Sure. Just different approaches. However, in React, if you have a bit of uh, low experience, uh, there are too many important you know, decisions to be made, and you will be not be sure if you made the right one. 
Yes, absolutely. It gives more flexibility, but more problems as well. It depends on your previous experience, because... Oh, yeah. well, actually, mm. my next question was how long did it take you or me to, uh, if you work with, to start with Angular? Mm. When, I don't, when uh, uh, Alpha version of Angular 2 appeared, I decided that I want to try it. And I decided I will write some application for our local currency market. Uh, which will uh, gather currency five times per year, per day, for, entire, for every bank in the country and uh, uh, return the information uh, <coughs> represented. And I decided to use Angular 2 on the front end. It was very raw, uh, Angular actually didn't exist. So I spent about half a day just trying to build it up. But afterwards, I have written a the whole application. Front end was pretty simple, like five pages, several grids, small grids, uh, some charts made with charges, uh, so nothing special, and I spent about three or five nights doing it. Yes, yes, yes. So if you're using Angular CLI, I believe you can start very, very easy. We have some trainees in our company which uh, follow program uh, of front end development and uh, usually we have like separation one month for uh, Angular, for example, one month for uh, React, and one month it depends on um, projects. Target project it depends on twenty. Probably it might be some Node.js experience. Probably it might be Vue.js or something like that. And uh, one month is enough to train it to understand the whole infrastructure of Angular and build something acceptable. Not like whole world, but some interesting application. So it's easier for newcomers as well. Easier for newcomers as well. But <coughs> on the other hand, I can say React is hard for newcomers. Okay, if you compare Angular to Angular, is uh, uh, the second version easier? The second you? version is much easier because when I learned Angular 1, I broke my uh, brain about providers, factories, and uh, single way binding, two way binding, the signs like uh, equal in beginning, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, Angular 2 doesn't have any hidden features. It has services, and services are services, no different kinds of services. It has directives, and they are just directives without types of directives. It has components, and idea of components is much easier to understand for newcomers. So in these cases, I get Angular and React became closer to each other because of paradigm become, became closer. So I guess, uh, not guess, I believe Angular 1 was much harder to learn. Of course. It depends uh, on what you need, because uh, there were some cases. I'm sorry, I can't remember which exactly when this uh, rigor, this validator uh, passed incorrect value. Like, I can f can't remember probably one si symbol after two, before two, or before dot, or something like this. So it doesn't fall. Probably, probably, probably it allows spaces in the mail. Some supported by some uh, providers' emails, but uh, sometimes <coughs> probably won't allow users to register with spaces in the mail. So uh, on our projects, we use regular expression, we use pattern to validate emails. Yes, so it has Yes. Yes, yes, yes. No, there is there is a standard for email validation, and I guess some one of you probably know about it. Uh, no, no, no. I can't write by memory because 
It's a little bit worn, uh, just a second. Uh, oh, I've written that it is so. No, no, sorry. Uh, I believe I can find it. No, it isn't. Oh, yes, here is it. <laughs> oh, no, 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 it's. Short version. It's, it's short version, just seconds. I can't remember, it's so standard exactly. A, just a second. Uh, which one? Eight to nine, yes. Probably not. Okay, just believe me, it's much longer. So, I guess nobody checks emails but that standard. Uh, on my personal projects I checked just it has dot and two yeah, symbols and that's it. Because who cares? But on enterprise usually they ask you to do something more complicated. More questions? Thank you for attending. <laughs>